Hi guys, Will Terry here, and this video is going to be called What I Learned in One Year Tabling at Comic Conventions. Wow, I can't even believe it's been a year. Most people don't get to document a whole year of their life, or, well, at least I've never done it before. And it's just, this has been really cool. And so I'm going to do a look back video at the different um, conventions and then also update you on my most recent convention which was last week Salt Lake City Comic Con and talk to you about what I have planned for the future and different things like that so let's kinda get started I I got a few comments like will you rub your nose a lot while you're making videos I can't help it I I have allergies really bad I always had them from a kid from the time I was a kid I used to get shots once a week and stuff like that so if you see me rubbing my nose, that's why I'm not a I'm not a coke addict. Um, sometimes it drives me crazy though, and I would have video from last week, but I got an allergy attack that was like it was like it was it was it was a ten it was a good one, and so the first day at the comic convention, I was on a lot of Benadryl and just kind of like zoning out and everything but anyway so I thought I'd kind of share some pictures of my setups and things like that um, from different events and if you're new to my channel if you haven't watched my videos before if this is the first one or or maybe you've missed I actually made a playlist of starting off um, the, the very first convention that I did which was one year ago Salt Lake City Comic Con and that was my very first time ever tabling, uh, my very first time ever selling anything retail on, on my own, you know. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through all that. Um, and I'll link that playlist below. So let's get started. Um, I might also say, let me, let me kind of start with the story. Um, you know, I never really planned on doing this this is that's one of the cool things I think about being an artist entrepreneur is you can kind of as you go through your life if something you you know if something hits you that you want to do and if you have afforded yourself the time um, through your freelance work or through whatever you're doing um, you know you can entertain different ideas and different options um, you don't have to just be one thing, um, one dimensional. You can do a lot of different things. Um, and so I, um, had never done fan art before. I talked about this in, in former videos. And one of the things that I, I finally did was I drew my first fan art piece. This is it here. And, um, I kind of got addicted to it. And this was, this was kind of, uh, you know, I, I thought that it would... I didn't understand fan art for a long time. And didn't understand why people really did it. Um, always kind of thought, well, you know, you should just get your own style and do your own stuff. But I, I really do feel like there's something you can definitely learn um, from redesigning someone else's character. And, um, and you can also really um, connect with an audience through characters that they already have fallen in love with. And that can help introduce them to your work. Um, I've had a lot of people that have found my website um, and later said that they, from the fan art, from the convention, from handing out cards or whatever, um, or seeing my work online, they've then gone to my website. They've then found out that I have um, an online school, svslearn.com. They've also found out that I um, have children's books for sale and have bought both that way so it's a really good marketing tool as well or can be if you use it that way um so anyway i'm a children's book illustrator and i asked the question on the first video um you know can a can a stupid Ill children's book illustrator make any money doing um, fan art and selling it at comic conventions remember if you watched the first video i had a lot of friends um in the, from the animation industry, from the illustration industry, from the children's book il industry, from students, my, some of my students at UVU, um, and I go to our local uh, comic convention in Salt Lake, and 
it was basically a chance to go and see everybody, you know, and just go visit and hang out at their booths and and talk to people and see all the the stuff and maybe get some prints and then go home. And that's kind of was the the first time that I went to a comic convention and that would have been um, in 2013. In 2014, I went again, only that time, I really wished that I was tabling. I kind of got jealous. And I just kind of felt like, man, I, I, uh, I could do this. I should be here. I, for some reason, I just felt like I'm missing out. I, I need to be doing this. And, you know, I, I, I think I've talked about this before too, that, you know, there is a disconnect when you're a children's book illustrator and you've got an audience, um, you know, if you're not a, a big, huge shot illustrator who um, well, people are collecting your work because you've won the Caldecott or you're a New York Times bestseller or you've um, got a book that's won a bunch of awards or whatever, um, chances are people buy your book out of convenience or out of um, serendipity, you know, they happen to be at a store or they happen to be looking at one of the the um, um, the adverts that get sent home with kids and your book's in the Scholastic Book Club or something like that. I've had a bunch of books sell that way. But at any rate, um, a parent sees a book and maybe it's a frog book or something that, that um, they're into and so they get it and they give it to the kid. But at the end of the day, a lot of times, the end user isn't a isn't a huge fan of yours, or you never meet your huge fans or whatever. And that's when you're kind of in, a, in the the medium range in the children's book world. Or at least that's my perception. And so you know, and your 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 end user doesn't even have a wallet. You know, the kids don't can't really buy your book. And so there's always been this kind of disconnect. I've done book signings at Barnes and Nobles before where you see the mom or the dad and they're like, uh, you're there and like, Oh, okay. So the, the author's here or the artist is here and I can get a book signed, but it's, you know, then they ask the kid, do you want this book? I don't really care. Sure. They could get any book. They don't care about your book so much. They're just getting the book. Okay. So, that was one of my um, curiosities of selling work directly to a consumer was, hey, maybe I'll actually get to connect with or meet people that actually want to buy something I created right then and there. And it would be the adult that wants that, that piece of art. Um, and it, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a completely different experience. It's, it's really a neat experience when someone's buying your work because they want that work. And then they find out that you're the artist. Now they want to have a conversation with you or talk to you about it and just tell you how much they love it. And, and that's, a, you know, as artists, we like our ego stroke. Um, we want to know that we're, that the work that we're doing is actually changing someone else's life for the better, even if it's just for a split second, just for a moment. We want to know that we've made a difference. And when you go to a convention and you sell art, you get those a lot of those different moments and it's it's just really neat and then you and then i've now that i've been to uh, my first convention the second time which was salt lake because obviously we just it's my one year anniversary last week i had people coming up that said oh yeah i recognize a lot of people that had bought my work the previous year and were back to buy more because i had new stuff that they hadn't seen and then someone would tell me, you know, I we decorated our baby's room, we love it, and you know, it's just it's those are neat stories, and it just makes you really feel good. Okay, so, um, let's see where to start. Okay, let's start with, um, you know, let, let me finish. Let me finish starting with uh, talking about this little Harry Potter sketch. You know, I did that one. I did a few more. They were getting um, a lot of attention on Facebook and on Twitter and um, and Instagram. And 
that made me feel like, okay, well, maybe this is worthwhile, worth doing and stuff. And so, you know, I, I ended up getting five or 10 of them done. And then it was like, once I, I think once I got to about 10 or 12, I thought, you know, I think, I think people might actually want this, um, at a convention. I might be able to just go there and pay for a table and, and sell some of these and it might be worthwhile. And as I looked into it, I remember thinking, uh, you know, how do I get copies and how do I make it worthwhile with, with the stuff that I'm going to have to buy? And I realized this is going to be expensive. And I think one of the reasons why I want to talk about this is because I know that a lot of you guys um, have tabled or thinking about tabling. Um, and, you know, it, it is a lot to think about. And that's one of the reasons why I made this video series is, you know, I looked for, for videos and there's some good ones out there. But I never really saw anybody's journey. And so that's why I wanted to um, do this video series over time. Um, but in looking at it, I, I basically just decided, you know, and like everything that I've ever done uh, in my life, is it's always been easier to just jump right in and do it rather than to spend a lot of time um, making calculations and figuring things out. I kind of, I operate mostly on hunches and feelings and that that's a really important part when you're a business person it's also really important to crunch numbers and to look at numbers both are really important there are a lot of business people that get paralyzed because at the end of the day they can't get enough data to to, to make a decision and when you talk to successful entrepreneurs you find out that there's always a time of uncertainty where the decision has to be made to risk, right? So what I'm talking about right now is, you know, I see a lot of people, and it seems to me like a lot of their first experiences in finding out whether they have an audience that will want the work that they have is to show up at a comic convention and just kind of spend all this money and time prepare you know laying out everything and setting everything up only to find out that they're not selling much at all um and really having a hard time in not sometimes not even making back the the cost of the table which is really a harsh reality for a lot of people that that are doing this um and one of my 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 biggest uh pieces of advice is test out the work that you're doing on facebook on on your social media um, because if you're not able to get people to click like for free you know if you're not able to get a lot of feedback and attention and shares people wanting their friends to see it you will probably have a hard time at comic conventions you know people people want to be the first one to show their friends something that's really cool and really neat and if you're putting your work out there um, and it's not getting loved and attention. You know, you can say, well, I don't have that many friends on Facebook or I don't have, you know, that, that much of a reach. And there's some truth to that. But at the same time, um, there are a lot of unknown people in the world who create something that goes viral on, you know, Twitter, on Reddit, on, I mean, on any, um, any website that has a, a broad reach. Um, and so it really does come down to the quality of the content that you're putting out there. Um, so I would, I would say if, if people aren't responding, you're, you're not changing them emotionally. You're not creating the kind of art that you need to be creating that will get them to some, some stranger to stop and look, see what you're doing and have an emotional reaction to it. If, if, if they can look at your artwork, if, if now not everybody's going to have the same emotional reaction because we all have different likes and dislikes and things like that. But if 10 people look at your work and none of them have an emotional reaction, you probably need to keep going. And, you know, and, and I don't think that at that point it's worth spending the money um, to do it. However, I will say that spending the money to... to um, and pull the trigger to to get a table at one of these conventions means that you've created a deadline 
and you're probably going to work a lot harder getting ready for it. So in that sense, it is really good. But at the same time, I you know you can you can spend a lot of money now on the on the flip side of that, spending that money is a great education, right? You'll learn something every time. And that's kind of what I want to go through the things that I've learned um, at these different conventions. So here's my first one. I um, I don't have the best pictures, and I think one of the reasons is because I wasn't proud of my booth at all. In fact, one year ago at Salt Salt Lake Comic Con, I had the worst setup you could possibly imagine. I bought those those grid. Uh, things where you you know you hook them together with plastic pieces you get them at you can get them at almost like like at Target or at at uh, I think I got mine at Bed Bath and Beyond and um, I you know they're hard to set up there you can I there's nothing wrong with them as far as the way they look and, and the display that you can make we just did it in a really dumb way I've seen them used really well and I've seen them used really effectively and I've seen them used really crappy. And we did did a really crappy job. Um, here's an, a picture that I, I didn't even have. I couldn't even find a picture. I, I, I don't know why. I, I just I just wasn't proud of the booth. So here's one from... I, I snagged this off of Adam and O's Instagram. Um, so thanks, Adam. And uh, you can see in the background my booth there. And... It, the, I one of the things that I had forgotten there's Jake Parker standing there and one of the things that I had forgotten was something on my list was to buy sleeves the little plastic sleeves to put the artwork in and I forgot completely forgot I went up there and started hanging the artwork just kind of taping it up just taping up paper <laughs> and then Mr. Jake Parker comes up and he goes you know um most of the time people actually put their work in sleeves those plastic sleeves and I felt that like that adrenaline wash over me like like you know the, the nightmare you have that you're that you're naked at school you know and I just had that feeling like oh my gosh what does everybody think of of my setup they all know that I'm naked and I'm I'm just coming to I'm just becoming sentient to that point um so that was horrible to realize that I didn't have any sleeves um, and it was too late to get any. And so I had to suffer through that weekend. Um, and it showed that the, the setup was horrible. I had a hodgepodge of things. I was trying to sell my own originals along with it. I talked to somebody else this weekend about you know selling fan art with original art. I think it can definitely be done. Um, I did a, did a really bad job. I really feel like um, you should brand your booth, but I do feel like there's ways to maybe have a box um, or a little rack of other work that doesn't really impede the look of your booth. Um, probably the biggest lesson that I've learned in in doing these conventions is that as people walk past your booth, they're they're looking on one side or the other. So, at best case, fifty percent of the people are actually going to even look at your booth that go down the aisle, right? So of the of the of the fifty percent that look your way and glance at you, there's certain keys clues that they're going to get. One, is there a freaky, weird, stinky artist staring back at them, right? Or is there an oh is there a well-dressed, overly cute uh, young artist staring back at them that just looks so eager for a conversation, because both are a turnoff. Like when you go into a when you go into a store, you go into a department store. We're programmed to say no when the clerk says, "Can I help you?" Even if you need help, you're gonna say no. So we just don't want. We want to browse. We want to look. Um, so we don't want someone looking back at us but the second thing is is there anything that I'm seeing over there that's interesting and it has to catch your attention in a split second it can't look like it also has to look organized it can't look like a hodgepodge it can't look like a yard sale or a, a garage sale and so 
yeah, so those those are the things that I've learned more than anything um, is is kind of branding. And so at this first convention, we had built this the the grid wall in this little like jail cell window, you know, and even we built it like a foot thick. And then I don't know if you can see. I guess I don't. Yeah, in this in this photo right here, up above my head there, we I put some of my colored prints like they were in jail on top like I don't know what I was thinking but it was just a horrible look and people would come up and then they'd notice those up there and like oh that's weird you know and I just just was horrible it was it was a bad it was it was neat doing it but at the same time we just didn't sell that much and the reason we didn't sell that much was were many the reasons were many um, but it was a great learning experience we moved on um, round two was my second convention was at CTN, CTNX in, in LA, in Burbank. And that one was a lot better simply because, um, I had sleeves for the artwork, you know, but you can still see that it was still, uh, um, I had to grab this, this photo from Instagram. I couldn't find it, but, um, you could still see that, um, you know, I, I'm I'm at this point I'm like selling all kinds of stuff. I've got like fan art, but I'm like saying, but look at this. Also, there's some art that doesn't match at all, and you know, and it it, it really I, I created this really confusing look for the booth. The third convention that I did was this little tiny one out here called LTUE, Life, the Universe, and Everything, and it's a actually a writing conference. And the reason that we did that one that was the first time that that Wayne and Will kind of joined up together. I think I've talked about Wayne before. He's he was one of my um, or he was the uh, the guy I went to school with and shared a cubicle space in the in the studio with up up at school in art school. And uh, so you know we've done everything, and uh, so it was just logical. He wanted to come along and, and help me do this, and from there he ended up. Um, staying together on that and we ended up putting some money in together um, to to basically go from here on out and uh, we the reason we did LTUE is we, we wanted to we got the TV I think if you remember um, we thought that people would really love to watch a, uh, like speed paintings on the TV that would really catch their attention and and force them because it would be different. Most people don't have a TV playing at their at their booth, and so if we get that, then people will start watching it, and then they'll want to know more about what's going on with the art. They'll come over and buy a print or something. And you know, um, at LTE we we made six hundred bucks, but it was a really it was like a two day thing, and it was really it was at a hotel and it was really small. And it was, again, it was just to check out that TV setup because a few weeks later we had um, Salt Lake Fan X, which in the, here's, you can see some pictures here of that. Where we had the TV involved there. That was our, my first time with two tables. And boy, did that make a difference having two tables. Um, you can see still um, in this picture right here, I couldn't let go. I couldn't totally not put some of my art so you see this you see all this fan art and then you see this little uh dragon piece that doesn't belong um in the middle with this this blue dragon with the orange flames coming out and uh gosh it just it's like just not there yet you know like it really is an evolutionary process to to basically what you're doing is starting a store we even had you know we had t-shirts and we were trying to trying to do that and you know that was the t-shirts the is tough because you got to have a lot of different sizes and then a lot of women don't like the the crew neck they want more of a, a ladies cut and um, it just becomes kind of a nightmare being able to stock everything then you're dealing with colors and shirt colors and things like that and so we kind of abandoned the t-shirts we we have since sold all of them luckily but um, we're kind of done with that the other thing we noticed was that people just didn't watch this stupid TV. I mean, it, this is where, you know, sometimes you take your experiences like, do you like watching TV? Yes. Do I like watching TV? 
yeah. Um, do I? Do a lot of people sit around and watch TV all day? Yep. Do is that? Do people love to go to the movies? Yes. Do people like watching videos on YouTube and on Facebook? Yes. Do they like watching speed painting videos? Yeah. Um, so it stands to reason that if you put those at a convention, they would want to stand there and watch. No, <laughs> they didn't. Now that I mean, you know, we we tried it at two different conventions and didn't really have anybody watching um and so you know i think i think that it, it's something that could work at like a, a convention like ctnx where most of the attendees are art students so i mean everybody there is an artist and so if you're doing a demo there chances are people are going to start watching because they're they're into that but i mean like at a comic convention how many people I mean, you, I, and, and in my mind, I, I went through this and I thought, well, but, but people are enamored when they can't do art. Sometimes they want to, they're, they're just, you know, enthralled by watching someone do something just as really silly and simple. And, you know, they'll say things like, well, I could never do that. And yet we couldn't get anybody to watch. So we sold the TV. It's important to be able to move on. Um, when something doesn't work, you know, um, creating, creating a shop, a store, creating products that people want. There are so many variables and there's so many things that you can't predict. Again, you just have to try them and see if they work. And if they don't, if they work great, if they don't, you throw it out and you try something different. So we figured, well, all that space that we that we use for the TV, we could utilize it for more prints. So, you know, I, I was still drawing, and by this time, by Salt Lake, I had I had had enough prints, and basically decided that I was going to do a a Kickstarter for the book for the the book called Little that I did. Um, and so I needed the room anyway. The TV wasn't working. So in this next one, you're seeing me here at Phoenix. Um, Comic Con, and that's when uh, I was basically finished, or just about finished with the Kickstarter project there. And Phoenix was basically our first show, I I would say, where we had almost nailed it. Um, got we had gotten rid of the TV, and we um, we basically just um, had our had a really nice setup there. And had all of our artwork out there, and just um, were able to really capture people's attention. I think the booth looked really consistent. I had gotten all of my personal artwork out of there, and I might say, you know, some people will say, well, and I, I let me just let me just back up a second and say there are a lot of different reasons why people would do a comic convention or would table at a comic convention. One might be to do commissions to get commissions. Another might be to sell fan art. Another might be um, to, um, uh, what was the other one? I guess commissions or selling fan art. Basically to push your own brand, your own IP, your own comic, things like that. So the, the, and, and all of the above and, and maybe a combination of, of different ones. But, um, you know, I, there are people that go to that are tabling that aren't there to try to make a ton of money. And I get that. Um, what I finally came to terms with is I have three businesses. Basically I have my freelance business where I do children's books. I have my online school where I do tutorials and lessons. And then I have, now I have the conventions where I can make money, um, selling fan art. And that's primarily what people are looking for at conventions anyway. Uh, when they go through Artist Alley, they're looking for their character. So I just finally came to terms with this is a separate business and I don't need to push both. Now, what's interesting is the book, and I've talked about this before, but the book that I'm working on with Penguin Random House right now, they asked me to work in this same style. So when that book comes out, it will actually look like the booth. I mean, it will look like the, the artwork in the booth. So I will probably end up selling that children's book at future conventions when I get it. Um, 
simply because it will fit in. And there is a, a conversation a lot of times that comes up where um, people are, people are like right now I don't have an online store. And the reason is because I had, had it up on Etsy and my son was running it and then he got a really good job. He couldn't do it anymore. And I don't have time to go to the post office and I hate the post office. I'm not going to go there. And so I took it down. Um, I think I have somebody that's going to fire it up again for me and run it. Um, but at conventions, people often ask, you know, they, they want to know, well, what have you been doing? Like you're, you know, it looks like you're established with, with this art. Like what have you been doing? What else do you do kind of a thing? And it leads into the conversation about children's books. Like, oh, well, why don't why aren't you selling any of those here? And I'm like, well, because out of a hundred people that come and stop at the table, you're the only one that's asking. And so if I had my, my colorful children's books that don't match the booth, sitting up they're gonna basically unbrand the booth so um that's why i don't have them so anyway um okay so we did phoenix and again you know i gave my numbers like how much i made on, on all the conventions in each video but like in salt lake a year ago we made a little over fifteen hundred dollars and you know to some artists that's that's a that's a good amount of money that's a really good amount of money but for the amount that I spent as you recall if you've been watching the videos I spent about four or five thousand dollars getting ready for that because I did um, you know I bought a lot of stuff for the booth but I also um, offset printed my prints and um, and so I was upside down and I was kind of feeling like gosh I wish I really wish I had made a lot more money um at the time but you know i got put a good game face on it and just realized that i'd make it up over time and i'd i'd work hard and figure out what we did wrong and you know i when i went away from the first convention i was kind of broken in the sense that i wasn't sure if i was going to be able to to turn it around i didn't really know what i needed to do and i had to really analyze things and and come to terms with the fact that um over time that my setup could get better each time. And this is this this goes back to the video that Jake Parker um, made recently. Now this is September 6, 2016. But he made a video called Finish Not Perfect. And this is a great example of that. You know, um, there's no way that I would have the booth that I have today if I hadn't started a year ago failing forward, right? So every time we did a new convention the booth was better every single time because I just wasn't uh, willing to set the same setup every single time without making alterations and questioning and asking myself could I make it better you know what can I do to make it better so if we go back and we look at um, Salt Lake Fan Fest which was in February about six months ago you see I had this 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 banner here and then we're going to fast forward to Denver. And Denver was my sixth convention. And you can see I've upgraded the banner. Um, so taking, you know, taking profits and then rolling some of them back into the booth. I Again, I think that you have to look at, um, you have to look at doing a table if you're going to do this. Now, you know, some people just want to do their local conventions um, just for the fun of it or just to make a little money or just to ba basically be able to hang out, um, push push their stuff. There's, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. And in that sense, you know, maybe you don't want to spend the money. Maybe you don't have the money to spend. Um, and so, you know, you, you stick with the same stuff. If you have money, you can, you know, obviously you can make upgrades. And so, you know, that's what I did um, with this, looking at the banner, just realizing that, you know, I, I think I can brand the booth a little bit more saying what they're going to get with a banner with more, um, characters that people can easily see. And so you'll see in this one. Um, and then also, um, you know, Wayne came up with those spinning racks, which were a huge success, um, with the little circle on top. That's kind of an eye grabber with the little alien up there. Um, this might also be a good time to talk about the fact that 
um, you know, some people are going to look at me and, and say, you know, and, and actually I had a lot, I've had a lot of people come up to me both in Denver and in, um, in Palm Springs, which was our, our next, our seventh convention. And then again, here in Salt Lake last week and say they, they couldn't believe that I had gone this far in just one year and that I've, that I've improved this much in one year. And they, they thought, well, you've got it. You've had to have been doing it for at least a couple of years. No, it's only been one year. Um, and then I think a lot of people are probably tempted to say, well, if you have money, you know, it takes money to make money. If you have money, you can make money. I just want to remind you guys that, uh, if you never watched my video on how we basically, um, lost everything, you ought to go back and watch that because, you know, we went through a financial meltdown, a financial crisis where we lost our home and we lost our car. We had our truck repossessed. Um, and I talk about that whole thing and I'll link that one below too. Um, I, we, I had to work really hard to get back up to where I had money to spend on, on things like this. And also, um, delaying gratification, like I've talked about before, is it's a huge part of my life right now, which is living below your means. Um, when you do that, your stress level will go down. Um, and it'll give you the capital you need to make decisions, um, like starting another business or improving the business that you have. Um, and so by living in a smaller house, then we could afford a bigger house, but we have a smaller house. Um, we um, drive old cars. Um, we don't buy everything new. Um, we don't go on a lot of vacations. We, you know, there's just a lot of places where we cut corners and um, we, we spend money when we need to. And that means that we're going to be able to have a lot more money in the future um, simply because we're putting it into um, things that are paying off right now, you know. So actually, you know, things have never looked better. And, you know, I don't say that to brag, but, um, I mean, it, 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 you know, there was a time where I thought that I would never be here again, you know. And when you're when you're down in that, that, that zone, um, it, it, it looks bleak and you just, all you can see is, is, is down, and, uh, you know, I was there and I talk about that in the video. Um, so anyway, um, uh, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, Wayne, we, we had talked about this before, just how I always have to throw this in there and give the, the Denver convention union such crap. I mean, like they, they wouldn't let us use our dollies in there and our power tools. And we need, we needed the little power drill to, to put the racks together and stuff. We had to hide that. It's ridiculous. Um, so I just have to throw that in there. Um, then, you know, my books came, uh, from the Kickstarter about two weeks ago, excuse me. And then of course we took them to Palm Springs, which was last week, our seventh convention. Our setup was basically the same from Denver to last week, except that we got another circle, uh, Darth Maul to put on top. And uh, we were also in a booth. I didn't get good pictures. And I apologize for that. But um, And then I'll just kind of gl gloss over that. What did we learn in Palm Springs? In Palm Springs, we learned that you don't want to be against a wall. In other words, if whatever you can do, you want to be on a row where there's other vendors on the other side from you. And I and we were on, you know, the, we were on a row where the wall was across from us. And the amount of people that, that went down that, the rows that were behind us that were doubles, was, was the, it was they were packed compared to ours. And, and so we, I think we would have done a lot better. We just didn't get to control placement on that one. That, that one kind of gave us kind of a bad show because of that. We ended up making, um, we still made $5,100, which was, was really good. A lot more than I, I was really worried, and uh, but we did okay. Um, even with our travel expenses getting down there and back, um, didn't make a ton, but then in Salt Lake, um, we did pretty good because we had a, where I think we were on a really good row. We had a really good setup and this was the first time that we had three tables. So this is our setup in Salt Lake, um, just last week. 
in September first, uh, second, third, Com um, Solly Comic Con, and you can see our two circle graphics up above on the spinning racks, and uh, I think that was all that we had new this time was that little Darth Maul character. We did have a few new prints um, uh, that we put in a box that had like we had a one thing that's a kind of a neat thing you can do. You know, we had a little box that because um, we had too many prints to go on our display, um, too many different ones um, that we couldn't display them. So we put like probably I think there's like five or six that we just put in the box along with some other ones so that when people flip through, they could actually make a discovery of something that wasn't on the display anywhere else. And um, that's supposed to be like a little marketing um, trick where you know if someone feels like they discovered something that's rare they might be more likely to buy it I don't know if that works or not we didn't don't really have any way to test it but it was kind of fun to 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 do that um we did have the books uh this last week and I think I told you in the in one of the last videos that we sold 57 of the little books in Palm Springs we sold 140 and Salt Lake Comic Con. They were just, we just had no problem selling them. They sold themselves. Um, they were so good that, well, or I don't know, people wanted them enough that some kids tried to steal one. And one of our, one of our customers that was sitting there was watching them, saw, saw the one kid because they, they hid behind the, the spinning rack kind of thing off to the side. And the one kid said to the other one, you can take it. You can, you can do it. And the other customer was looking at him, looking at his friend who was about to, they're about to kind of take it and run off. And he made eye contact with him. And then the friend said, no, it's okay. And then he put the book back. And so we gave a discount to those customers. Um, but anyway, yeah, I felt really, uh, really fortunate to sell those because now I know that I'll, I'll be able to, uh, I know that there's an audience that people are going to want them and we'll be able to get rid of the ones that are in our garage. Um, so yeah, that was Salt Lake and, um, it was, you know, I, I, again, I want to go back and just revisit the idea that, you know, I had, I had people that, you know, were, were asking me like, you know, how do you, how did you do it in one year? How did you become profitable? Oh and yeah. We made, um, in Salt Lake, we made 85, just a little over $8,500. And, uh, so that was our second best show. Our best show is still Denver. And, um, you know, felt like I, I didn't think we were going to do that well at all, but because Salt Lake people aren't as free with their money, but, um, we did, did really well. And I had a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people that had seen my YouTube videos had come up to me and talked to me and, and, uh, I, I love talk, talking to people that, you know, I mean, just, it's just, it's just cool to share experiences and I want to know what their experience is and stuff. And in chatting, I just kind of found a lot of people that were really surprised that, um, that I could do this in a year. And the one thing that I told them, I think the biggest thing was again, to just, just to kind of reiterate is you, you've got to find something that, that changes people emotionally. And I just can't stress that enough. You know, um, you can get a Wolverine, you know, you can get a Wonder Woman from anybody's booth, um, except mine. I haven't done Wonder Woman yet. <laughs> I can't, I, I need to come up with a really good idea. I want to do a really good Wonder Woman, but I just don't want to waste it, you know. Um, but, you know, you can, you can get a, you can get a Jack Skellington from anybody. But what are you going to do? What are you going to say that's different? You know, and I just, I, I, I tried to meet the girl who does, um, she does all the, the superheroes as cats and, uh, I wanted to talk to her, but she was always busy and I, I never, every time I passed, she was talking to somebody, but you know, um, I don't know if you've, you guys have seen her art, but it's really well done and it's also, it's all cats. Well, you know, if there's a hundred thousand people that go to Salt Lake Comic Con, 
How many of them are cat people? Well, maybe 30,000 are cat people. Maybe higher, I don't know. But boy, whenever one of those people comes by her booth, and if they see it, I'll bet they stop, you know, because she's speaking directly to a certain group of people that love cats. And they're at Comic-Con, so they probably love cats and superheroes. And so she's combined those two things together. So when they see that, they're going to just go, oh my gosh, look at this. They're going to be excited. So that's an emotion they didn't have. And now they have this excited emotion. And now they're stopping and now they're looking and browsing and chances are they're going to find something. But if someone, if you're, you know, if if you're walking along, I mean, you, if you haven't tabled before, what you really should do is take a notepad, walk through Artist Alley, and see what you, what, why you stop and, and what you're looking at and what forces you to stop and look. And then write that down, you know, take notes and, and figure out what it is that, or or look at and also look at the booths where there's a lot of people, a lot of customers looking and, and try to figure out what they're into. Like why are they talking to this artist? Why are they buying from this artist? Why are they waiting in line to buy from this artist? Um because you know, just doing another uh Captain America, well, you can get Captain America from you know, a couple hundred booths. Um why are they going to buy your Captain America? That's the question that you need to answer if you're going to do this. Um, last thing I'm going to talk about is future plans. And uh, I think I'm not, I'm probably not going to make any more update videos in this playlist on comic conventions because we have a bunch more planned. Um, and I'm actually, my friend Wayne is actually going to go without me to some conventions. Um, and th that's a little bit dicey. A lot of times you can't go into Artist Alley unless the artist is there, which I totally understand because it's it's supposed to be about artists for artists. So he's moving out into doing more um, booth spaces and stuff, and because of my schedule, I just can't attend all of them. So he's gonna he's gonna take it out there and and do it on his own. Um, but um, so I probably won't include much more because I mean this is I think I've given you what I can do now. However. We do have a plan if we can if we can do it if you know it's it's I don't we don't know how much competition there are there is but what we really want to do is pay for a really expensive premium spot um, out on the floor on the convention floor probably a double booth so like a ten by twenty and probably hire another person or two to help us work it um, and and try to really go for it a really huge set with maybe another another rack that spins with another big circle graphic maybe even bigger than the other two um and see if we can really uh rock the numbers like you know exponentially from where we are right now um just to see where we can take it uh, because at this point right now doing that wouldn't be that hard the numbers that we're getting will allow us to um, risk that much money um, a double would probably cost anywhere from two to three thousand at some of the conventions that we're looking at and um, that's a lot of money to risk but there's a lot of money to be made as well one of the reasons for being out there is there's fewer aisles so you know so an artist alley you might have 10 rows uh, but when you get on the floor there's often only three or four rows uh, with bigger spaces in between and i think you capture larger numbers of people that would put eyes on your booth and more potential to sell and things like that it'd be a great um experiment um i did talk to another artist who has done that who paid i believe he paid thirty five hundred dollars for a space a premium island booth um and said that his numbers tripled so there's precedent for for artists doing that i've talked to several other artists um that have done booth spaces and said that they they love them but then again there there there's also the luck factor in there where you can um get a bad placement or you can get placed next to geico um, with their salesman out there and then that creates a dead zone because nobody wants to walk by those stupid salesmen at a comic convention and get hit up for for like car insurance and i've talked to people who have been on the other side of geico or xfinity or something and they've had a really bad show because 
the traffic just it's like a traffic killer i don't even know why these conventions let those guys in um it just doesn't seem like it even belongs but uh, i guess they've got the money right so um they get in there okay so that is my one year report and i guess the answer is a stupid guy a stupid children's book illustrator can make a few bucks at uh, comic conventions so there you go um don't uh, subscribe unless you want to see more videos like this and I'll see you on my next video